verse 2, when darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. And every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Then verse 3, his oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. And all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. Then verse 4, verse 4 is what we're looking for, church. It's like John said, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. How are you going to stand before him faultless? In Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ only. Amen. And uh, thank God, that's a, that's a tremendous, tremendous old hymn. You can't beat them old hymns, praise God. And uh, I think I'm going to stay with the old time way. Amen. Uh, and by the way, we're going to try to get a choir going soon too, praise God. We can fit, we can fit about 50 of you up here. And I might not be able to seat you. Uh, but but we got we got too much growth, too much singing talent uh, in this room to not have a choir. So uh, we'll get that going hopefully pretty soon in the next few weeks. Uh, but I, I won't do that, Amen. Some y'all will sing and uh, just be ready for it. Praise God. We'll pile you up here and or down on the side. It don't matter. Just just get up here and sing, Amen. Y'all done learn. I, I'm trying my best to kick the doors off religion and. And old traditions that don't that don't have a bit of biblical basis in the first place. So you, you ain't gotta have a law, praise God. You just gotta have an area. Y'all y'all get up here to sing uh, for Jesus, and that's gonna be your choir, Amen. And uh, God God's gonna work that out too. All right, y'all pray for Lawson. He's gonna sing for us this morning. We're gonna get right into the service and the message.
pick up our reading in verse 54. And uh, I, uh, I'm going to tell you, I, I, I want to, I want to deal this morning. Uh, some of this I, I've, I've dealt with several times through the years in trying to teach and educate uh, why we do what we do and why we are what we are. Amen. And uh, I have some handouts that Brother Matthew's going to run off for me this coming week. I'll, I'll bring it to you next week. Uh, but we've got a goodly heritage, friend, and, uh, and it did start with Catholics, and uh, we're not out of them. Uh, it goes back a little bit further than that, where the uh, disciples were first called Christians, at first in Antioch. And uh, I want to begin this morning to start with salvation and then show you some uh, distinctives of why we believe what we believe and why we do what we do. Uh, I hate to make uh, the Mafia parallel, but it's pretty akin to it. I, I've been at this a, a long time. Jerry's been at this a long time. And when, when you're in it uh, and, and you're, you're serving God, if you, can, you can see some of the uh, political things and career things that, that turn into uh, church and religion. And, and it's very easy to see why some people get turned off to uh, church and religion and career type ministries and things like that. I'm not interested in that type of thing. I, I, I want to show you what the Bible says about why we believe what we believe and do what we do. And, uh, and, and obviously it must work, amen, and it's not me, it's God. And it's the fact that people get a little tired and weary of what they've seen out of religion and church. And uh, it's not a business to me, it's not a business. It's not even a career path. It's a calling by God. It's not a career path because I couldn't pass math, praise God. And, and I think that's what happens a lot of times with, with folks. Uh, so if it ain't like I've heard it or saw it, well, you'll be all right. Maybe you've heard it or saw it wrong somewhere down the line. Especially if you're in some of these traditional churches that can't get past their tradition, even if it's not the Word of God. So you know, let's just see what the Scriptures say. Amen. Acts chapter number 7, we're going to start in verse 54. When they heard these things, so what is taking place at this point is Stephen has preached the gospel to uh, this group of, of religious people, and he got him in trouble. Amen. Imagine that. And so Stephen has been preaching, and he's preached uh, the Word of God. He's went through the Old Testament, and he's brought it up to the New Testament as uh, Jesus Christ has died. As a matter of fact, let's drop down a few verses just to bring you up to the context of verse 51. And uh, as he's closed out in verse 45, he's referred to David and Solomon. And then he comes to verse 49 and he refers to our Lord being Jesus Christ. And then as he's given his invitation, it's not softly and tenderly played. Here's how Stephen's invitation goes to these folks. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Amen? That's how Stephen's invitation started. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. You do that, you won't get saved. You won't get saved independent of the Holy Ghost, moving on your heart, and you resist Him, you won't get saved. Amen? The Bible says, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which, uh, it, and it's amazing how many times Jesus and these New Testament prophets, primarily Jesus though, he, he went about and he began to say, ye and your fathers. And what he was saying is this thing has been going on for generations. This, this religion that's taking you to hell and making you twofold more the child of hell, it's been going on for generations. Amen? The Bible says, verse 52, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which so before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. So that's Peter, or that's Stephen's message, and that's his invitation. So let's see how this worked out for Stephen that day. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. So we know they were convicted. They got cut to their heart. Paul would be pricked in his heart. 
So the Bible says when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. They started gritting their teeth at what he was saying, mad and angry at the word of God for going against their traditions. And the Bible says, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. It, it got so convicting to them that they literally put their fingers in their ears to prevent or attempt to prevent what Stephen was saying. But here's the problem. You can stop your ears up to what Stephen's saying, but you can't stop your heart up for what the Holy Ghost is doing as a result of what Stephen's saying. Amen. Can't get away from truth, man. Not once you get prayed, praise God. And it said, Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran up upon him with one accord. So here, here they come in mass. And the Bible says in verse 58, And they cast him out of the city, stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes. Now, take note of this. I want you to... Now, it's underlined and circled in my Bible. I read all of this to bring you to verse 58 and show you this process of salvation. Here at Stephen's invitation, and now it is in Stephen's stoning, verse 58 is a very pivotal verse for the rest of the New Testament all the way up until modern-day Christianity. Verse 58, the Bible says, and cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. There's somebody standing by that day listening to Stephen's message. And the Bible says, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, Receive my spirit. So he identifies who the Lord is. In verse 60, and he kneeled down and he cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Boy, that's very akin to Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is people murdering him for preaching the gospel. He said, Lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today in the name of our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, for this group here today. Lord, to hear the Word of God being preached and taught. And God, I, I need your help, Lord. I'm nothing without you. And Father, I pray that you would strengthen me, God, physically. But God, more than that, I ask God that you would enlighten and illuminate my mind. Lord, and communicate my thoughts to these people today in a manner in which the Spirit of God would do the preceding work. And Father, I pray that you would help me, God, to teach and to preach with power and unction. And God, if, if you don't move, if the power of the Holy One doesn't come down, Lord, it's all in vain, and we recognize that. And I need you, God. You don't need me, but you, I certainly need you today. And I lean upon you and look to you. God, I pray, Lord, if there's one in our midst that's never been saved, never been born again, never had their life changed by the quickening power of the Holy Ghost of God, I pray today, God, that you might move on their behalf, Lord, to draw them to yourself. God, I pray, Lord, that you would work in the hearts and the lives of people here today. God, I pray, Lord, that you would check my heart and spirit as I preach and communicate these truths that it would be done in a manner that you would be pleasing of. And Lord, we'll thank you and praise you. And God, will bless your name in Jesus' name. And for Jesus' sake, we ask these things. Amen. And amen. Thank you. You can be seated. This morning, as we begin to look in the Word of God together, we have arrived here at this place in the Bible, the book of Acts. And I've been in the book of Acts. In fact, I have preached or taught through Acts my podcast uh, last year for a lot of you that had heard those messages. And of course, the book of Acts is a, uh, a history, if you please. It is a documented history that was penned uh, by Luke, but it was inspired of the Holy Ghost to give us the acts of Jesus Christ as they were done 
in the early church. And so we see the formative years of what the church is and the formative years of what the local New Testament church should become all over the period of the centuries that would come ahead before Jesus Christ raptures us home. And that being the case today, I want us to take a journey on the script through the scriptures, starting in the book of Acts, chapter number seven. And I want to preach here for just a little bit on our heritage of grace. Our heritage of grace. I thought about the old song, a goodly heritage, and I think about the heritage that we have as Bible believers, as Baptist people. And I make no apologies for that. It's not the name necessarily that uh, we hang up on, but it is the set of doctrines and the set of belief systems that we hold true from the Word of God that do not date back to Rome and they don't even date back to Roger Williams. They date back, ladies and gentlemen, to Jesus Christ and the Apostles. We are not Protestants and we are Catholics. We are Bible believers that identify ourselves as being Baptist people. Now, that being the case, I do want to give you a little bit of uh, background on what we're going to talk about. The Roman Catholic institution uh, came about in AD 313. That means after the death of Jesus Christ, AD 13, it came about as a quick synopsis, and I won't get into it a lot, uh, as Constantine sought to marry the Church of uh, Rome with the state. And that being the case, uh, it would bring about an institution known as Roman Catholicism. And from there you uh, saw the Crusades where uh, it was trying to be taken by force and bloodshed. And that was their start of this long, bloody history that uh, the Roman Catholics had. And you'll see throughout history that some folks made some reformations and pulled out gentlemen like Martin Luther who saw the errors of that. But that's not where my history goes back to. And if you're a Bible believer, that's not where your history goes back to. And you may have heard different and your dog tag may say you're a Protestant. But if you're a Bible believer, that's not what you are, ladies and gentlemen. Our history goes back to Christ and the disciples where the disciples were first called Christians in a place called Antioch. It goes back to Jesus Christ seeing a group of people that were no more than drunken fishermen, cussers. They were uh, tax collectors and tax evaders. And that ragtag bunch of guys got saved by the grace of God. And they set the world on fire with the gospel of Jesus Christ that they believed and they preached and they taught. And thereby, pinning two-thirds or pinning the entire New Testament. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that's where our history got started. It got started with Jesus seeing that group saved, baptizing them, instituting the Lord's Supper, and from there making the proclamation that the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church as I build it on myself. And from henceforth, there have been a group of believers that held on to their Bibles, clung to them, as some of our politicians like to say, clung to their Bibles and their belief in that Bible. And it didn't matter what the Pope said, it didn't matter what Constantine said, they refused to sprinkle babies, they refused to worship Mary, they refused, ladies and gentlemen, all the dogma and doctrines of that group of people and said, we're going to preach it and teach it and believe it like the Word of God says. That's our standard, not a creed, not a bylaw, not a contract, but the very words of God that we hold in our hands today is what we stake our life, our religion, and our belief system on. That's where our heritage goes back to, our heritage of grace. Now that being the case, first of all, let's talk about the process of salvation. Because grace will always start with salvation. It's got to start with salvation and what we are in being saved. Then we're going to talk about, I'll probably get through one or two points on the progress of salvation. In other words, the progression after we get saved. 
So God's order, ladies and gentlemen, as in our lives as Christians, is that we get born again. You remember what Jesus told Nicodemus? He said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. So when we get born again, not confirmed into the church, not 12 steps into the church, not catechisms into the church, not an acolyte in the church, not an altar boy in the church, not a good little Sunday school boy in the church, but born again by the grace of God. When we get born again, the next step after being born again, and I'll teach you that in scriptures, would be baptized into that local church and from henceforth to serve and live for Jesus Christ. Not as a ticket out of hell, but to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ from that point in your life forward. You see, a lot of people through the years, and it got really bad in the 80s and 90s, and I don't want to be too critical of the effort because there was a lot of good heart in, in behind that. Not only was there a lot of good heart and motive behind it, but a lot of good men were practicing it and a lot of people are saved as a result. But what has happened through the years is salvation has become some kind of ritualistic issue that you can say a prayer or repeat after me and you can say these things and did I pray right or did I go down the Romans road or did I say this right and, and get hung up on all of those mechanical issues and there never be a heart change. There never be a heart breaking. There never be a Holy Ghost of God dealing with you in your lost condition. And because of that, we've seen some generations that have been made twofold more the child of hell because they were led in some prayer where there was no pricking of their heart. They were led in some, some phrase that there was no pricking in their heart and they got issued their ticket out of hell and the nice two gentlemen left their living room that day and that guy went on living the rest of his life because I prayed some prayer in the living room with these two nice gentlemen and I got my ticket out of hell. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not what salvation's about. That's not the salvation of the Bible. Salvation, ladies and gentlemen, from the scriptures is a lost and a dead person, dead in their trespasses and in sins, being made alive to now enter in back into the fallen relationship that was back into relationship with Jesus Christ and God the Father through the rest of their lives until the day that God calls them home. That's biblical salvation. It's about relationship, not religion. Amen. Now that being the case, let's talk about this process of salvation. As we come to the conclusion of Acts chapter number 7, we've got Stephen. Stephen has preached the gospel. He has preached it faithfully. He has went through the Old Testament and he has led them through the gospel story. And he is, henceforth, he has taken them through what they believed about their generations and their fathers. And he's brought it all up to be an in this man, the God man, Jesus Christ. Well, when he began to preach that, he didn't say it like they wanted them to say it. Amen. He didn't say it like they wanted to hear it. As a matter of fact, Stephen called them murderers. Stephen said, you're stiff-necked. He said, you are responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. And when that happened, the Bible said that they were cut to their hearts. They began to grit their teeth. As they began to gnash on it with their teeth, they began to stop up their ears. And it got so bad that day that they began to stone Stephen. And as they're stoning Stephen and they're throwing these boulders on him, and they're crushing his ribs and they're crushing his face. Friend, they weren't just throwing rocks at him. The stoning would be boulders that sometimes it would take two men to pick up the boulder. Two men to pick up the stones and they would bind them down and they would drop them on their heads and they would drop them on their ribs and they would crush their facial bones and crush their skulls and begin to break their ribs open, ladies and gentlemen. And so here's Stephen laying there and after boulder after boulder and stone after stone begins to drop on him and break his bones in two and blood spurt out of his mouth and his eyes and his ears because of the crushing blows of the stones. He looks up to Jesus and he says, I pray God that it may, may not be laid to their charge. And ladies and gentlemen, just like the Holy Ghost of God does, there was a young man there that day. This young man that was standing by that day 
was the young man who held a position of authority within the Roman councils. Matter of fact, he was a Roman citizen. Not only was he a Roman citizen, but he was also a leader. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a zealot, if you please. And as he was standing by, the individual who was responsible for signing off the death warrant. Y'all know what a death warrant is. It's actually signing the paper that under my authorization, we're going to kill Stephen. Under my authorization, we're going to kill this family for, for, for teaching and preaching Jesus Christ. Under my authorization, we're going to kill this guy for preaching Jesus Christ. Under my authorization, so on and on it goes. He was the one signing the death warrant for Stephen to be stoned that day. The Bible says, look with me in verse 58, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. That was to lay down the fact that we are witnesses to the death of Stephen, this apostle. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this would be very important. On this day when Stephen preached, we don't read of one person getting saved. I don't read of three lines of just as I am. I don't read two lines of softly and tenderly. I don't read of anybody going into anybody's living room. I don't read of any. But what I do read about is there was an old sinner man that was a young man that was lost as he could possibly be. So lost that he is responsible for the death of this individual that's getting stones cursing on his face. I read of him standing by there and something begins to happen that's beyond signing a card. Something begins to happen beyond confirmation. Something begins to happen beyond any religious process. And that's the Holy Ghost of God begins to do a work in this young man who is responsible for the death of Stephen and many others that will change history forever. Who knows if you got saved today, what kind So today is we see this young man, Saul, standing by, consenting unto the death of Stephen. Let's transition to chapter number 8. Saul's still up to his old tricks. The Bible says, chapter 8, verse 1, you know you can get convicted and stay up of the old tricks. You get convicted and go to the bar, praise God. But you ain't going to enjoy it. Amen! You get, you get convicted and go back and do what you were doing, but you ain't going to enjoy it. Now, ain't, conviction ain't salvation, but conviction must precede salvation. What do you mean? You don't have to go there. John 6, 44 says, No man can come unto me except my Father which has sent me draw him. Amen? So conviction must precede salvation. That brings about the new birth. And so here's Saul. Saul standing by. Here's Stephen preaching the gospel. And as he's hearing Stephen preach the gospel, he goes back to doing what he's always done. Because that's how it's always been done. And this is my job. And this is how I make my living. So we go to chapter 8. Watch this. And Saul was consenting unto his death. You see that? Consenting unto his death. I didn't lie to you. I told you the truth. He was the consenter of the death of Stephen. He was the authorizer of the death of Stephen. He's the one that signed the document to put the stones on Stephen that day. And the Bible says, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So right there, praise God, I like that. Let me just not preach that verse a minute, praise God. Because of the preaching of the gospel, they were scattered abroad. They were scattered everywhere. They were trying to flee the oppression of Rome and trying to flee the Judaizers that wanted to kill them. But the apostles, the apostles said, we're standing our ground. We're not scattering nowhere. We got right here in Jerusalem and we're going to tell you you can kill us, you can stone us, you can throw us over the ledge if you want, but we're still telling you that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. Amen. 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 God help a bunch of low down lily liver rotten preachers today that are woke and that get up on an ecumenical platform with a bunch of Muslims and Allahs and everything else and 
things start bothering you a little bit, you start thinking about you fact that you really are lost, and you heard the gospel and you need to get saved, that don't mean you're going to get better until you get saved, friend. Matter of fact, he got worse right here. Look at what he starts doing. He steps his game up. Bible says here, verse number two, that's the divine man, verse three, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house. So now he's going from house to house, hailing men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now, we are introduced to another individual today. Put Saul in the backdrop for just a moment. Everybody put Saul in the backdrop. Stephen's now dead. Now we're introduced to someone else in verse number five. It's a gentleman by the name of Philip. The Bible says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto the things which Philip, uh, which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles. Then we see verse seven, unclean spirits coming out, people that were possessed aren't possessed anymore. And I like verse number eight. It reminds me of Bethany, man. It says, And there was great joy in that city. That's what you can have in a church when you just kick all the religious junk out and give Jesus and teach Jesus and love one another. You can have great joy in that city. Amen. So Philip goes down and preaches the gospel. Great joy in that city. Then we got this individual by the name of Simon. We meet Simon the sorcerer. Look in verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself for some great one. In other words, he was daddy rabbit around the, around the church house, praise God. He's that old daddy rabbit. It's always been running the show, you know. He was some great one with his sorceries and bewitching the people. To whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. To him they had regard because of long time he had bewitched them. He had been doing what he'd been doing a long time. Amen. Hey, stay with me. Now watch this. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, how you get the kingdom of God? Jesus said you get born again. When you're preaching the kingdom of God, you're preaching you must be born again. So Simon's bewitching him with sorceries and with all of the ways he's always done things. And then Philip comes in and he's preaching to them the kingdom of God, that you must be born again. Now watch this. But when they believe Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God. So the first step is they believe. Do you see that right there? They believe. And after the Bible says they believe in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. So we get ready to get into that as we close out this chapter in just a minute. So after their belief, then they were baptized. They were baptized to be saved. They were baptized as a means of salvation. They were sprinkled. They were baptized to get them into the church. They were baptized because they were made of nine. And that's what you're supposed to do when you turn nine. They were baptized because they were 12. And I heard 12 was the age of accountability. I'm going I'm I'm to preach out all day, amen. And they weren't baptized because they were 12. They were baptized men and women. Amen. Amen. Men and women. That's grown folk, amen? A child can be baptized, but they better be saved before they're baptized. Or you're going to send that kid to hell when they die, trusting in the fact that they got saved because they got baptized because so you let it happen. Amen. I'm serious about this. Mom and dad might not be serious about this stuff. I'm serious. I don't want to send no kid to hell because some of them dumped them in a tub of water or in a pond somewhere down the line. Amen. I ain't standing for God for that. You be saved and then you get baptized. That's what it says. Okay, everybody still with me in the Word of God this morning? They believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized both men and women. Then Simon himself, now this is an interesting uh, individual, Simon believed, but well, hold on, hold on, stay with me. What's the difference in Simon and these unnamed men and women? Let's, let's go into this. Then Simon himself believed and when he was baptized, so he, was, he believed and he was baptized. Something Simon don't do though. It ain't necessarily that he don't do it, he didn't have it. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. So he was saved, or he did not saved. Look at the Lord Jesus, sorry, forgive me for that. What saved? He believed, he was baptized, he continued. Now watch this with Philip. And he wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which 
which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John, who when they were come, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, they received the Holy Ghost, and when Simon saw that through laying on the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. Ho ho, ho ho. We see, come here, we see that Simon believed, but the Bible says in James that even the devils believe with fear and trembling. We see that Simon was baptized. We see that Simon continued in your local church. Don't you see that in that Bible? But, 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 I know they say, you better what your mouth say you know so and so saved. You don't know so and so saved just because they say they believe. The devils believe with fear and dream. I know when so and so got baptized. You better watch your mouth saying I know so and so saved because they got baptized. Simon's been baptized. What I better remember here, all of my lives. That don't mean nothing. Simon continued with them. There's a grave difference in these men and women that got born again and baptized and Simon. Let me show you the difference. Stay with me. The Bible says here, verse number 18, And when Simon saw that through laying on the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, Simon has a heart problem. Simon, ladies and gentlemen, looks it. Simon has joined himself with them. Simon, it says, even believes. Simon, ladies and gentlemen, it says, was baptized. But Simon had a problem, and it was deeper than baptism. It was deeper than the surface. It was deeper than his head knowledge. It was deeper than him joining up in the church. It was the fact on the inside, Simon had a heart issue that was not right with God. And you can check everything off the list and still go to hell when you die, friend. If your heart's never been changed. Your heart's got to be changed. Pricked in your heart. You ever been pricked in your heart? Born again and birthed into the family of God. Changed by the grace of God. Check. He believed. Check. He was baptized. Check. He continued with them. His heart was... Can't put no check by that heart change though. Y'all with me? Everybody with me? I'm just, going, I'm just reading verses with you. Stay with me. Verse number 17, then laid their hands on them that they received the Holy Ghost. Verse 19, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands. Oh, Simon wanted the power. Okay. He didn't want relationship with God. He wanted the power that could be given him in his position for God. You watch out for power hungry men and church members. Their heart ain't right with God. And I don't care how long they've been doing what they've been doing. They're going to spend eternity in hell if their heart ain't right with God. Amen. 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 The Bible says here, watch this. He says, saying, give me this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Watch on Peter. Peter steps up. Now we introduced him. We're not introduced to Peter, but we come across Peter. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee. I wish we had enough preachers that had enough guts to tell people that, praise God. Your money is going to perish with you. I don't care what you give. I don't care what you own. I don't care what your name's on in town. You're going to go to hell with your money. Amen. 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 Now watch this. Verse number, most people won't even say hell. They'll just say it's a separation from God. Okay, all right, you'll see. Now watch this. Watch this. Verse number 20. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. You know what that tells me? That tells me you can believe. Even the devils believe with fear and trembling. That tells me you can be baptized. That tells me you can join up with them. That tells me you can even give money to the church That's right. and be lost and on their way to hell. Amen. Because here's the promise. Watch this. Peter looks at him and says, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. That's about how I respond to some folks. I ain't, I ain't, got, a, I ain't got a time for foolish junk. He said, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. Watch. Remember I told you? Just so you know, preacher didn't lie to you. I said he had this check, this check, this check, this check, but one check he didn't have. 
right. His heart wasn't right with God. Look at that. Well, 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 would you look at that? He says, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Do you see that? He laid everything out. He would look good. Matter of fact, I'm sure he'd have a suit on. He'd probably be on some committee in some Baptist church. He'd probably be some hierarchy in the community. And he'd have all Watch what he says. Verse 22. First word out of Peter's mouth after he told him he was not right with God. Can we say that together? Repent. That is to turn. That's not just a heart change, friend. That's a heart change that leads to a change of actions. Amen. So what did he have checked off? He had belief checked off. He had baptism checked off. He had church membership checked off. He had tithing record checked off. deeper than the surface. It's deeper than the appearance. It's deeper than how it looks. Y'all look at my God giving eyeballs. I'm looking at you in your eyeballs. <coughs> hey, we pray, we pray and we sing. Listen to me. Check, 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 check. But he had not repented and his heart was not right with God. That is the difference in Simon and his unnamed men and women. Stay with me. Verse 23, For I perceive that thou art in the gall. Oh, there's, there's something there. Kind of made him angry, kind of made him mad, kind of made him bitter. I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. He said, I know that down on the inside, although everything looks good, you're eat up with bitterness, you're eat up with iniquity, you're eat up, you can listen to me, man, you can play the part all you want to, but if that inside's not being changed and turned in by the grace of God, you're still in the bond of iniquity and wickedness. And the Bible says right here, then answered Simon and said, pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. When they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, he returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many of the villages and Samaritans. Now, here's the issue. You never read where he gets saved. He just said, pray for me. He prayed for me. Because I eat up with bitterness. I eat up with anger. I eat up with all this junk on the inside that although I've got every checklist on the outside, all I can say is, Peter... Y'all pray for me. Let's move on. We run into Philip again. Look at me. Verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. So here's Philip. Imagine this. See, I've often thought of Philip in this situation. He's in the middle of a great revival in Samaria. Great joy in that city. People getting saved by the grace of God. And all of a sudden, God says, Philip, you need to get out of here and you need to go down into Gaza and you need to go in that, that, that way. So all of a sudden, he's got to leave the revival meeting now where there's great joy. Stay with me and notice what the Bible begins to say concerning this matter. We're going to start here in verse number 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go southward, or go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. Now, here we go. Stay with me. We're getting into some good stuff. And he arose and he went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia. How about that? How about that? Oh, you 
if you got that, don't you? Everybody okay with that? Amen. Amen. You say, my Islam started in AD whatever. Well, I can tell you right now, I see an Ethiopian getting saved right here around AD 26 or AD 46, praise God. Long before Muhammad ever come along, I see Jesus Christ saving an Ethiopian, praise the Lord. He saves them all red, yellow, black, white, all precious in his sight. It's Jesus Christ that saves men, women, boys, and girls. The Bible says, and eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to, Jer come to Jerusalem for worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot. How about that? Now let's just get this scene, okay? Let's get this scene together. He's reading Isaiah, as the prophet. So he's reading from the book of Isaiah. Let's find out where he's reading in just a minute. It's blowing. I, I like it, though. Keep it going. Keep it. Now notice what it says. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to thy chariot. So what, what do we have here? Philip, God told Philip to go down into the, the, the Gaza. He said, go southward. You just keep going. Philip didn't ask him why. Philip's not trying to debate with God. Philip's not saying, but God, I'm preaching revival meeting and their offerings are going to be big and everybody's happy. And they're going to, he just said, all right, God, you want me to leave Samaria? I'm going to Samaria. Where do you want me to go? So he starts heading back down to Gaza. As he starts going down to Gaza, notice what happens. The Bible says in verse 29, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. So Philip rolls down into Gaza. He looks up. There's a big old horse. It's a chariot. It's a pretty horse. Nice horse. And he looks up there and he sees an old Ethiopian fellow sitting up on top of there. As he looks at that Ethiopian fellow, he's sitting there reading what appears to be the, the Bible. And what appears to be the Word of God up until this point. So the Holy Ghost tells Philip, you see that Holy Ghost, he's always in the background working, ain't he? And so he tells Philip, you go up and join yourself to this chariot. So can't you see Philip? Here he is. He looks up at that fellow on the, on the, on the horse, that Ethiopian, and standing on it, sitting on that horse. He said, look, man, God told me to get up there with you. What? God told me to get up there with you. Okay, all right, hop on up here, Philip. So here's Philip, this Ethiopian unit, fell up on top of his chariot. Praise God. Watch. Philip ran thither to him, heard him read the prophet Esaias, and said, Understand what thou readest. And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. So come on up into the chariot. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so open he not, he not his mouth. You want to know what he was reading? That's Isaiah 53. Put that in your footnote or in your notes. Wait, listen to me. How, it, I'm, I'm trying to show you something here. Stay with me. Verse 33. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? He's calling Philip a prophet. The Ethiopian eunuch looks over at Philip and he says, you call him out yourself or you call him out somebody else? And that just gives the door open to Philip. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Somebody say it with me, praise God. Preach unto him Jesus, amen. And the Bible says, and as they went on their way, they come into a certain water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Stay with me, let's take a pause and come up to where we are right like quick. Where are we, preacher? The, the Holy Ghost told him to leave Samaria and go down to Gaza. Now, why in the world would the Holy Ghost tell Philip to leave a revival meeting where everybody's happy, everybody's getting saved. Simon's probably under conviction saying, pray for me, boys. Now all of a sudden, he's got to leave there and he just starts taking out on this journey to Gaza. He don't know why he's going. He don't know what's taking place. Some of y'all wish could get a hold of this man. Can I tell you, God took that man of God out of that in the middle of that revival meeting because there was an old Ethiopian eunuch that was under conviction down there
doing what I was doing. I was just following God. Would somebody in 2021, for the love of God, follow God? Yes. Would somebody learn to follow God? Amen. 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 How many times you've heard people preach a preacher or something? Well, we've met about this, and we've decided. How many times have you heard somebody say we've been fasting and praying for about 40 days on this? Not much. Not much. Amen. So here we've got Philip. Leaves a revival meeting in Samaria. Makes his way down to Gaza. Timing is just perfect. And there's that Ethiopian eunuch. Got a Bible open. Old Testament open up, this, up until this point. And wouldn't you know what he's reading? Isaiah 53. The greatest prophecy of the coming slaughtered Messiah that you'll see in the Bible. And he looks over there at Philip. And Philip comes up on that chariot with him. And Philip says, what you mean over there, buddy? He said, well, I don't really know. He said, I need somebody to explain it to me. Philip said, okay, I'm your man. And from that point forward, he starts telling him about Jesus. Now, like anybody under conviction, like anybody that the Lord's dealing with, stay with me, this is important to the message. This is important. Like anybody that God's dealing with, He immediately responds, what do I have to do? Amen. What do I have to do? And He says, what does hinder me from being baptized? Stay with me. Stay with me. Verse 36. See, here is water. Will you take a cup and sprinkle it on my head? Nope. See, here is water. That would be a body of water, church. See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? Will you baptize me, Philip? I want to be baptized. Philip, I need to be baptized. I feel like there's something that I need to do after reading Isaiah 53. And notice Philip's answer, verse 37. And Philip said, If thou believest, look at what he says, with all thine heart. Now, I said all of what I said to say what I'm about to say. What is the difference that you see in Simon and this Ethiopian eunuch right here? Simon, ladies and gentlemen, heart was never changed. He believed. He was baptized. He was in the church. He was given tithes and all. According to everything we read, he's trying to give his money. But Peter said, the heart is not right with God. But now he comes up on this Ethiopian eunuch. And he's right for pickings, man. He's under conviction. He's reading the Bible. And like anybody that don't understand it, thinks, what do I have to do? I've got to be baptized. Baptism is the answer. And notice Philip's response. He says, if thou believest, that's a continuation, with all thine, what? With all thine heart. Salvation is a heart change, friend. Salvation is an inward change that will lead to an outward change. But I've seen a lot of people make an outward change and never have an inward change. And on the inside, they are just full of hell and full of the devil and full of spite. It's a heart change, amen. amen. What hinders me from being baptized? He said, believe us with all thine heart. What did Simon not have? He didn't have a heart change. Amen. Now watch. Verse 37, Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and he said, I believe that Jesus Christ, glory, Hallelujah is the Son of God. And you know what? He didn't have to do nothing. The sinner always thinks, what do I have to do? What do I have to go to? What step do I got to take? Matter of fact, he didn't even have to be baptized. Thief on the cross didn't have to be baptized. That's just the next step after it if you left on this earth. But honey, he could have left this earth after believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he wouldn't have went to hell. Just like that thief on the cross, praise God. It's a belief from the heart 
What is the difference in Simon and this Ethiopian eunuch? The change in their heart. Now watch. That point, y'all horse lovers over there, y'all help me, praise God. How you make it stop? How? Let it do. How? Pull that bit for you to make it go. Whatever makes it stop, that's what Philip said. Stop that thing right now, praise God. Stop it. Whatever we got to do to stop this horse, stop Because we got one getting ready to get saved. The Bible says, and he commanded the chariot to stand still. My imagination is so full of the Holy Ghost, he just says, stop, man, it stop. That's what I see. And they went. Now, hold on. Come on, come on, let's read this together. All us, all us good Baptists, praise God. Well, I'm a Baptist called John the Baptist. No, you ain't no Baptist called John the Baptist, praise God. <laughs> no, you ain't. It goes back further than that. Go back to Jesus, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm, a, I'm a Baptist because, you know, my daddy was a baby. My daddy, my daddy was. My, my daddy's daddy was. Watch this. He commanded the chariot to stand still. Now, and, now we got two grown men right here, church. Two grown men. We got the Ethiopian eunuch, and we got Philip. And the Bible says, and they both went down where? Into the water. Now that verse in that practice has slaughtered many of our Baptist forefathers that you've never even heard their names. Do you know how many will slaughter at the hands of Roman Catholics? And not only Roman Catholics, but Protestants that even hell continue to hold to the belief of infant baptism. How many of our forefathers that are unnamed but are named up in heaven, that unnamed group over there in the book of Hebrews for teaching and preaching that you don't infant baptize, that you've got to be saved by the grace of God. And when you do choose to get baptized, praise God, y'all go down in the water together. Praise God, don't throw them in the water and lifting them up. Raised to walk in the newness of life. That watery grave just picturing what you just did in Jesus Christ. The death, the burial, of the resurrection. I identify with it. Buried with Him in baptism. Raised to walk in the newness of life. Hallelujah. Amen. Look. He commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went both down both into the water. Both of them into the water. Not rose water. Amen. Not holy water. Quit being so superstitious. That's what people get so superstitious. Well, that's the holy water. Would you take that holy water and scatter it everywhere? Quit being a witch. Quit being a witch. Amen. Don't be a witch. That's no witchcraft stuff, friend. Amen. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and choke you this morning. I? Baptized into the water. And they were come up out of the water. The Spirit of the Lord called away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more. His work was done there, praise God. His work was done there. He didn't even see him again. And he went on his way rejoicing. How about that, praise God? But Philip was found at Azazel's house and passing through. But hold on, we're not done. We're not done, but we're not done. I'm going to talk about the process of salvation. Not even getting into the progress of it. This is the, this is the final point as we go to Acts 9. Everybody remember Acts 7? Y'all remember when we started this message in Acts chapter 7? And old Stephen got stoned to death. And when Stephen got stoned to death, the Bible said that the one that was consenting to the death of Stephen and signing off on the death warrants was standing by. Naturally, he's the death executioner. He's the guy responsible for this. So he's standing by. And he's watching Stephen get stoned. He's the one responsible for it. He signed off on it. And he hears Stephen preaching that gospel. And he hears Stephen telling about Jesus. And he hears Stephen say, I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. And then we go to Acts 8, and he's still making trouble, and he's still making havoc with the church. We have seen Simon the sorcerer not get saved. And then we have seen this Ethiopian eunuch get saved. But all the while, that same Holy Ghost that saved that eunuch is working in that old boy's heart that was consenting unto the death of Stephen. Acts chapter 9, and we're going to work on closing. And Saul, everybody remember Saul? Saul was that guy. Saul was the one signing the death warrant. And Saul kept breathing out threatenings and slaughter. He's gotten worse and worse. That conviction's making him worse and worse. 
against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest. He desired him letters to Damascus. He's wanting more letters. He's more bloodthirsty. He's more angry. He, he's got more vengeance towards these Christians. That's what conviction will do sometimes to you. It'll make you hate that preacher. It'll make you spit your devil eyes at that preacher. It'll make you stop up your ears at that preacher. All that conviction was doing up until this point is made him angrier and angrier at God and his man. Amen. Amen. Watch out for that crowd and get some devil switches in her eyes. Like, yeah, you do go through town something. See your buddy. See what they Sean Brick. I got to say Sean Brick. <laughs> well, watch that cat right there. Sean Brick. Demons start switching in their eyes. Amen. That's Saul. Saul ain't got no better. Saul's got worse. Bible said he desired him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues. That if he found any of this way, whether it were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth. Ain't no preacher around, ain't got to be. Why? Because he doesn't hurt the preacher preach back. <laughs> In Acts chapter number 7. Notice what it says. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul. Why persecutest thou me? The preacher ain't around. The preacher's gone. It's just him and God. It's him and the Holy Ghost. It's him time to do business with God. And God wants to know why you're persecuting me, Saul. And verse number 5, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? So he knows. That's a capital L-O-R-D right there. He's saying, Is that you, Lord? What is that? That is that same Holy Ghost has now opened up the heart to the gospel that Stephen preached. And all the while, he's read about trying to live his old life. He can't live his old life anymore because he knows what Stephen preached on his deathbed that day was the absolute gospel truth. And so when Saul responds, he said, Is that you, Lord? Is that you? Is that really you? Have I been wrong about all this? And notice what Jesus says. Verse number five. And the Lord said, I am Jesus. Whom thou persecutest, it is hard for thee to kick against his pricks. Amen. Old Saul got pricked in the heart in Acts chapter 7, and we get to Acts chapter 9, and he ain't got away from it. Right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's the process of salvation. Stay with me. I'm going to tell you, I'm working on clothes. I've got about three verses up there. The process of salvation. We've got. Stephen preaching the gospel, making everybody mad. They rise up, Saul says, I'm signing off on his death. They start stoning him. And Stephen keeps a preaching. They're stoning him, and Stephen's keeping preaching. The whole time, until he finally gives up the ghost. God gives, takes the ghost from him. And as he's laying there dead, those clothes begin to drop at Saul's feet. Saul heard the gospel of Jesus Christ most likely for the first time in his life. And that inward struggle begins. Remember that inward struggle, Kevin? Oh, yeah. Jerry, you remember it? I remember it. Hey. Went on for weeks with me. That inward struggle. That inward struggle. You go back to the bar under conviction, don't even taste the same. Didn't even touch this time. God just deals with you. Miserable, angry. I want to kill more of them. They're making me mad. Every day, just making me mad. And finally, he's on his way on the Damascus Road with death warrants in his hand to kill more of them. The Holy Ghost of God. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, comes down. Pricks him in the heart. He begins to look up and say, Is this really you, Lord? And this battle, this war that's been waged. For we don't even know how long at least the chapter and a half in the Bible begins to succumb. Saul of Tarsus, this one that's been a terrorist, this one that's crucified the church and put people to death, says, Lord, is that you? The Lord says, Saul, 
It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. It's hard for you to fight that conviction. Samuel, why don't you just quit fighting it? You remember when God did that for you? Just quit fighting it, Samuel. And surrender to it. Watch this. Look at this. Look at this. Verse number 6. And he trembling and astonished calls him Lord again. Capital. He's not questioning now. He knows it's him. Lord, what wilt thou have me? Do you see the heart change in Saul of Tarsus? He's literally got letters in his hands to kill off more Christians. Lord, what do you want me to do? Because I know that ain't what you want me to do. Lord, what do you want me to do? Because I know this ain't the life. Lord, what do you want me to do because I know I can't live this life that I've been living anymore? Watch. Verse number 6. The Lord said unto him, Arise and go into that city, and it shall be told what thou must do. Saul of Tarsus gets up, a new creature in Christ. Goes and follows the Lord Jesus Christ. No invitation. No church. Preacher's dead. Preacher's dead. Preacher's been dead for a chapter and a half. The preacher that preached the gospel of Saul of Tarsus is dead and in heaven. But the fruit of the gospel that he preached remains unto this day. Because little did the world know that that one that breathed out threatenings and slaughter and hatred and anger and venom against the church would turn into the greatest friend the church has ever known outside of Jesus Christ Himself. And who knows what God can do with your life if you would surrender and say, Lord, what would Thou have me to do? What would You have me to do? He can take that life that was full of disgrace and turn it into grace. From disgrace to grace. But you see, salvation was a process. Saul didn't get saved in Acts 7 right there when he heard it. Now if this were today, if Saul, because Saul didn't get saved in Acts 7 when he heard it, everybody would say, oh, this must have been a fair today. He didn't get saved. Didn't get saved. But don't ever underestimate the Holy Ghost and the fact that He follows you home. He follows you to the bar. He follows you into the cesspools. And all of a sudden, what I enjoyed, I can't enjoy no more. And the way I acted before is starting to bother me now. And the things I said. Says Saul, Saul, why are you living like this? Why is this your life? Saul just lets it all go, drops it all, and surrenders to Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the process of salvation. Not, and I'm all for it. I love this. Visit, but got this wrong road. I'm saying, Lord, I'm saying, Lord, I'm saying, Lord, I'm saying. Lord would say, Lord say, Lord say, Lord say, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. You say, man, go to heaven and she took it out of here. Come on now. Come on now. Is that, is that, is that what you've read in the Bible today? See, did you read any of that? You know what happens in the Bible? The Holy Ghost. <laughs> or he don't. In the case of Simon. In the case of Simon. He believed. He believed. In the case of Simon, he was baptized. In the case of Simon, he joined himself to them. In the case of Simon, he was willing to give all his money to them. But 
in the case of Simon, Peter said, I perceive that thy heart is not right with thy heart. And thou art in the gall of bitterness. And in the same chapter, he tells that old Ethiopian eunuch, if thou believe with thy heart, thou shalt be saved. In that next chapter, Saul of Tarsus, who had all the head knowledge that any Hebrew could ever want, got pricked in his heart. Didn't he say his heart? Amen. Salvation is an inward act of the circumcision of the heart. Stand with me. Surely it could come. This is God's time and God's business. Playing for us. Our Father, I, I've given it my best. Given it my best. I've done everything you said to me. God, we turn it over to you. I pray that you use me as a vessel. God, I pray that your work will be accomplished. I pray that your work will be accomplished. Somebody, somebody come to help me pray. Anybody else? Anybody else? Folks moving around the altar. Somebody comes to the altar. You, you don't have to talk. You don't have to talk. You just pray with them. Just pray. I want nobody coming to this altar by themselves today. Anybody else? Folks already at the altar. Anybody else in this building? Need to come around this altar. Would you come? You know you've been saved. You know you've been born again. I tell you what, I love you. This, this church loves you. Jesus Christ loves you. Won't you come? Won't you come? Would you come today? Would you come? Anybody out? Anybody out there? Anybody out there today? Say, preacher, preacher, would you pray for me? I don't, I don't know that I have been saved. I don't know that I have been changed. Come on, come on, Miss Tammy, come pray. Come pray for Miss Tammy, would you come please? Pray for her. Nobody praying alone. Nobody praying alone. Come on, won't you come to Jesus this morning? Won't you come to Jesus? Won't you, won't you put that religious garb on the side? Won't you throw that religious garb around? Let Jesus prick you in the heart. Let Jesus do a work in your life. Anybody else? Anybody else in this field today? I do business with God. You call upon the Lord while He's near. You seek ye the Lord while He may be found. You call upon Him while He's near. Would you come? Everybody say, Preacher, pray for me, Preacher. Would you pray for me? I'll pray for you. I won't call you out. I won't embarrass you. This is nothing to be embarrassed about. Ain't nobody looking around. Somebody looking around, I'll call them down. Just between you and God. Anybody in the building say, Preacher, pray for me. I don't know that I have been saved. I don't know that my life has been changed, been pricked in the heart. I'll pray for you. I love you and I'll pray for you. Anybody else? As these are dealing around the altar, anybody else? Well, God's good. God's real. God's in the saving business, man. You look back at Samuel there, Samuel attended the service. The Lord just working in his heart, working in his heart, working in his heart, and called on God to save him. We need to keep all this mechanical junk out and just watch God really do a work in saving people, man. Really saving people. Would you come this morning? Go from disgrace to grace. From disgrace to grace. The grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Anybody else? We're not shutting all. We're not shutting this thing down. As long as there are folks praying, we're not shutting this down. Won't you come? This altar's over. Won't you come? I love you. These people love you. These ladies, these gentlemen, they love you. Our church loves you. Jesus loves you more than anything. More than I can ever even possibly love you. Jesus loves you. Won't you come? Today would be the greatest day of your life. The greatest day of your life. You say, I ain't had many good days. You start today. You start today. You start today. This process of salvation, how God works in your heart, changes you eternally.
Hallelujah. God do it. Thank God do it. God still moves. God still works. Old person Ray leaves services right then. See any of y'all ever heard? I know some of y'all did some bad services. Person Ray. Old person Ray, he preached like that, leave the service, shut his Bible, no invitation. Do it five, six, seven, eight nights in a row. Sinners just begging for an invitation, man. Wouldn't give it. Finally, last night, he gave it here. What do you say? You say you give God room time. Because he knows what he's doing. Even when we don't. Amen. I love everything. Any soul in this room, I love with all my heart. Thank God for you. Appreciate you. Thank you for listening to the crazy brother next to Richard Preacher. I love you. Amen. Jerry Sheen. Thank you for being with us today. I love you, brother. I want you to dismiss this today. Father, we come to you this day. Father, thank you for this message. Yes. Father, as he was preaching, I go back to the day that you convicted my heart yes. and how you drew me to you. God, I was a sinner on my way to hell. I didn't deserve your love. Yes. I didn't deserve your mercy or your grace. But Lord, you loved me so much that out of all this world, of all the millions of people, you came down for that day and spoke to my heart yes. and said, Jerry, I love you. And Lord, I am Lord. so glad that I surrendered my life to you. Lord, Lord you said in your word that while I was a yet a sinner, you died for me. Lord, you died for me when I didn't love you, I didn't care about you, I didn't want you. Because that's the kind of God you are. But Lord, I'm so thankful for the morning that I experienced salvation. And I surrendered my heart to you because, Lord, you made a difference. Lord, you took somebody who didn't feel like they were worth nothing and you loved on me. And you changed my life. Yes. And I thank you for every single person that you have changed their life and for everyone that you're going to change. Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you for the message. Lord, I pray this message will prick our hearts. And that, Lord, if there is anybody here this morning that does not know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, let them know that you love them. Yes. That you love them more than anything. Oh, God, yes. And Lord, that you're not going to let them go. Yes. Because you want what's best for them. Yes. You want to change their life. You see their pain. Yes. You see their suffering. You see every tear that they shed, God, and it breaks your heart. Yes. Because you love them. And I pray that every single person that heard this message this morning will make things right. Yes, that they will surrender to you. Yes. And Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do in every single heart. Thank you for the man of God who yes. preached your word. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me say this. Let me say that this is what I've been praying. It's this. It's conviction. It's conviction in services. All in vain unless the Spirit of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sound and brass and tinkling cymbal. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.